uh, I'll be talking on uh, Corona crisis in a very elderly patient. And uh, we all know that uh, the population uh, uh, in India also the age above 65 is definitely rising. And we may come across so many patients who are having Corona disease in the elderly age group. If we just look at the prevalence of Corona disease in the age of 60 to 80, uh, it is in the range of 50 to 20 percent. And if it is to look beyond 80 years, then it is 25 to 30 percent. So it is the high number of uh, patients will have Corona disease. If we just look at overall, the cardiovascular, cardiovascular, to cerebral vascular disease, high blood pressure, CD, and only arthritis is the other thing which is really high incidence in the patients uh, with the age of about uh, 65. Uh, if you look at the uh, overall risk score, uh, various uh, risk scores like coming up, the newer risk scores, every risk score includes age as an important factor. So whenever the age of the patient is more, definitely the chance of coronary disease as well as the risk of coronary disease is definitely high. Uh, as I have told, the number of patients beyond the age of 70 or 75 is definitely increasing, but many of the patients die after the age of 75. But if you look at the studies, various studies have not included uh, this patient into their uh, uh, trials. Uh, but nowadays, so many uh, with the age more than 75. Uh, this is very interesting. The coronary disease risk is very high in the patient's age is more. And that is the reason why you need to treat less number of patients to get a significant benefit. Suppose the patient's age is less than 50, you may have to treat 500 patients to uh, save one life, but if the patient's age is more than 75, then only one life has to be saved. Uh, aging can cause systemic hypertension, coronary calcification, uh, peripheral vascular disease, atrial enlargement will cause atrial fibrillation, degenerate changes in sinus node will lead to sinus dysfunction, AV node dysfunction, uh, valvular stenosis, there will be left ventricular hypertrophy and the heart failure in most of the patients. Uh, as you can see here, the, ra uh, the prevalence of unrecognized MI, unknown MI suddenly happening is very much high if the age is more than this. Another important thing is presentation is mainly many a times a congestive heart failure, not a primary chest pain, and ECG is many a times non-diagnostic if the age of the patient is more. Uh, number of the patients with non-ST segment MI is much more compared to the ST segment elevation MI. Comorbid conditions are very important. If you just look at the uh, here, uh, congestive heart failure, renal insufficiency, uh, stroke, fragility, cognitive, these are all the problems when you are uh, coming with uh, age 8 patients. In hospital mortality also is very high. We can say that for, uh, compared to the 40 year age, if the patient's age is 80, there will be almost 15 times more mortality for uh, myocardial infarction patients. Similarly, this is a grace registry clearly showing that if the patient's age is more, the risk for that patient is definitely high. Another important thing is new recently found is uh, BNP is more important risk factor compared to CRP if the patient's age is more. Treadmill test can be done in the elderly aged patient. It can give a good prognostic importance. The sensitivity may be a little bit high, but specificity is definitely uh, less in a patient's age is more. Uh, event reduction is significantly there if you are treating uh, elderly aged patients. When you are treating a patient of uh, elderly uh, life normal life expectancy is very important and we have to look into uh, this uh, when we are dealing with especially the high-risk surgery. These are the various ways we can have the life expectancy and we can decide the line of management. If you look at the medicine, aspirin and beta blocker, if the age of the patient is more than 90, it is not significantly high. But other medicines like heparin, clopidogrel, AC inhibitor, statins are definitely high uh, risk compared to the uh, younger age uh, populations. And mainly because of the comorbid condition and there is going to be significant interaction with the medicine. Antithrombotic drugs, we have to be really very careful. If the dose goes high, definitely the bleeding chances is much high, both with heparin, LMWH, and the GP2B. But this should be considered in light of the benefit of antithrombotic agent. So if benefit is there, definitely we have to offer an antithrombotic because it gives a significant advantage. Patient may have a small body size, lower creatine clearance, and more other medicines which can have a more sort of a drug interaction. As you can see here, if the adherence of the medicine to the patient, even if the patient is uh, aged more than say 80, if the adherence is more than definitely significant benefit can be achieved. So we have to tell to the patient, if, even though the patient's age is more, that you have to continue the medicine, it really gives a significant benefit. There are certain guidelines while prescribing the uh, uh, old age patient medicine. Loading those, we many a times uh, give a little reduced dose, especially in the female patient, glomerular filtration 
uh, I mean GFR we have to take into consideration. Hepatic, hepatic uh, maybe it may not be good. We have to take that also into account. Dose adjustment and the dose increase should be a little gradual. That means we have to wait for four or five days and then gradually build up the dose, uh, not like uh, we're building in a younger age of patients. Uh, we have to take care of the drug interaction because patients may have multiple medicines for the non-cardiac condition also. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that patient may have a non adherence to the medicine and patient may not take the medicine which is really required. If we just look at the thrombotic therapy <coughs> in primary angio, I mean, uh, in acute MI patient, definitely even the up to the 80 year age or 85 year age, we can say the benefit of thrombotic therapy is definitely there and should be offered uh, if the patient has come really, really early. Uh, fibrin specific agents like TPA may have more chances of uh, intra, uh, I mean, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, so we have to take that into mind. And we do many times give a low molecular weight heparin along with the thrombotic therapy. That should be weight adjusted. If it is not weight adjusted, then there is a more chance of bleeding in some of the patients. If we just look at the comparison of primary angioplasty versus uh, thrombotic therapy in uh, elderly aged patients, as you can see here, the mortality myocardial infarction and stroke. Everything is better if the patient has been offered a primary angioplasty. So we should not defer if the patient is, is really come early and if setup is there, primary angioplasty should be offered to that patient. This is a repurposition <coughs> strategy in the elderly patient. As you can see, no thrombolysis versus fibrinolysis and the primary angioplasty. As you can see here, there is a significant benefit of either thrombotic or a primary angioplasty. And decision about whether to give a thrombotic therapy or primary angioplasty depends on the availability, timing on the symptom, and the risk and benefit to that patient. So we have to judge an individual patient and then offer them um, a therapy which is required. If we just look at the aspirin, this is a comparison of the uh, patients aged less than 65, more than 65, the similar significant benefit is achieved even though the patient, so it should be given as a secondary prevention in most of the patients. Coming to the beta blocker, as you can see here, if the patient's age is more than 75, there is a comorbid condition, still there is a significant benefit in a post semi patient. So beta blocker should be given if they are tolerated well to elderly patient, we should not uh, restrict its use. Similarly, is uh, Remipril or the is inhibitor also, this is the HOPE study clearly telling that even though the patient's age is more than 70, there is a significant benefit of giving is inhibitors. And stable angina patient, many times we are offering an early invasive therapy. And early invasive therapy, as you can see here, there is an absolute greater benefit when the age of the patient is more. As you can see here, age of the patient is more than 75, invasive therapy, early invasive therapy is much better compared to the uh, conservative uh, treatment. Despite an uh, increased procedure risk, older aged patient may have slightly increased risk, but if you take that on also into account, there is a significant benefit. As you can see here, this sensible angina patient, we have a, a concept of aggressive lipid lowering agent, and we can tell that you may not give a very high intensity, but you should give a moderate intensity, like atorosate in 40 milligram or rosuacid in 20 milligram to the elderly aged patient, and it gives a significant benefit. Coming to the stable uh, coronary disease, there are various studies clearly mentioning both for the primary prevention and the secondary prevention that there is a significant benefit. They have taken the age more than 65, 80 in the various study. Rosova state in the Jupiter study also there was sub-analysis clearly stating that if the patient's age is more than 80, still significant benefit is there. Benefit of statin is in the form of mortality, coronary disease risk, re-MI, stroke, and need for re-intervention. So everywhere, the benefit is definitely there with the statin therapy. There is no increase in the cancer. So various, uh, I mean, the, uh, many times the risk in the older aged patient or a concern is that may have a high chance, but studies have clearly shown there is no high chance of uh, dose reduction. Maybe we may give a little lesser dose compared to the younger age patient. Uh, there are certain controversies for the primary prevention. We don't know whether the statin should be offered to that patient, especially if the patient is female. Second thing is, many a times we don't know the target level. That means in the elderly patient, what, what target we should achieve. That is also an important concern. And we also don't know many a times how much is the, whether there is a really significant chance of myalgia or myopathy if the patient ages more. Revascularization, we have to take into consideration so many things. What is the presentation, whether it's a ACS or a stable angina or a silent ischemia, whether it's a multivessel disease or a single vessel disease, and what is the patient's operative risk, compliance, comorbid condition, as well as when they were dealing with the angioplasty, what is the location, complication, complication likely, and according to, we have to take into consideration all these things and then decide our management.
As you can see here, invasive versus a medical therapy in the elderly patient, clearly showing that there is a significant advantage. So we should not restrict most of the patients. If otherwise patient is uh, health is fine, definitely we should offer them uh, therapy. This is a recent 2012, before say one week, this study was published in the JSCC, <coughs> clearly mentioning if the patient's age is more than 65, and they also have uh, analysis for them age more than 80, clearly showing that there is a significant advantage of drug coated stent. So we should not restrict ourselves. Many a times we have a fear that patient may have more bleeding or may have uh, long anticoagulation, I mean antiplatelet agents to be taken, and we, devoid, I mean, we avoid uh, uh, putting this. But this study clearly mentioned that this is definitely superior to the other therapy. Uh, mortality following angioplasty and CBG both increasing with the age, but if you can see here, there is a definite advantage with the angioplasty compared to the bypass if the age is more. Uh, when you are offering a uh, off pump therapy, there is significant advantage. So many a times surgeon prefers to do uh, off pump therapy because it has less operative mortality, stroke chances are less, and the bleeding complications are less if the age of the patient is say more than 80. Reverse relation survival, as you can see, medical versus either angioplasty or CABG, long-term survival in the age of 80 is definitely high and should be offered to most of the patients. These are some of the uh, interesting things we have to keep in mind while we are intervening the patient. Contrast in this nephropathy is a major problem because they have a, a high creatine clearance because of the age. They may have diabetes or comorbid conditions, so we have to take this into consideration. Second important thing, while well, CABG, many a times after CABG, especially if it is a, uh, with the heart-lung machine, then there is more chance of cognitive or higher functional abnormality, which we have to uh, take into account. And uh, we don't know the benefit in the women, especially of the off-pump therapy. So these are the uh, points to be considered when we are dealing with the uh, elderly patients. Uh, when we are approaching the patients of coronary disease, as I have told, the overall risk and mortality is very high in the elderly patient. So we have to be very aggressive. And we, as I have told, most of the medicines like aspirin, beta blocker, they may have little high chance of complication, but mostly they are well tolerated. And that gives a significant benefit. So aggressive secondary prevention is definitely important when we are dealing uh, with this group of patients. When we are doing an intervention, it should be done as far as possible with the experienced operator it, because uh, there is always a high chance of uh, complication, which should, needs to be avoided if we really want to give a significant uh, benefit to the patients. Uh, similarly, we have to individualize the patient, we have to see the overall health of the patient, uh, lifestyle of the patient, projected lifespan also is very important. So if the patient is having a comorbid condition like dementia or having a uh, not uh, projected good lifespan, then we may not offer a high risk, especially the high risk surgeries uh, should not be offered. We may continue a medical line of management. And ultimately the preference many times in the elderly patient we have to take into consideration, especially the patients and the family, whether they want to go ahead uh, with any high risk procedure or not. Uh, secondly, the complication rate, as I have told, is definitely more uh, with the bleeding. Uh, we have to keep in mind, especially the antiplatelet agents or antithrombotic agents. But as I have told, there is a significant <laughs> benefit, so we have to uh, give uh, this kind of therapy. Recovery times may be a little bit prolonged. Like if the CABG is offered, we, it may take one or two months to get a full recovery. And depression or the mental symptoms we have to keep in the mind when we are dealing in a patient's uh, allergic patients. So as I have told, the Benefit of treatment, we have to keep in mind risk of the treatment and the risk of the disease. As I have told, elderly patients have more risk. MI, unstable angina, very high risk compared to the younger age. Benefit is there. There is little high risk. But overall, if you look, compare the risk and benefit, then most of the time we have to give uh, aggressive lipid. And this, we have to keep all these things into mind. We have to individualize patient and discuss with the uh, patient and the family and try to treat. So example, if the patient's age is 80, Otherwise, very healthy, suddenly there is a problem, extensive MI, patient has come immediately with a cardiogenic shock. We know that risk in this patient is definitely high. And we know that if the setup is there where we can handle this kind of case nicely, like in the same hospital or any good hospital, then they should be offered a primary angioplasty and should not be managed conservatively, even though the age of the patient is 80. Thank you very much. I have been a cath lab jockey since like... 10 years and uh, believe me, every year the average age of patient entering the cath lab is decreasing. It has been an epidemic which white we are facing right now. So by definition, premature coronary artery disease
is the one which occurs below age of 65 in women and 55 in men. And Young's coronary artery disease is the one which occurs in patients less than 40 years of age. These less than 40 years of age, it represents the most severe form of premature coronary artery disease. In Western countries, the incidence is around 2 to 5 percent and in Indian subset, it is around 12 percent. The major risk factors of this coronary disease in young is smoking, cocaine and ethanol. Smoking causes higher catecholaminate surges, it causes endothelial dysfunction and plaque rupture. The relative risk of coronary disease is three times higher in age group of 35 to 44 as compared to non-smokers. Cocaine causes spasm, plaque rupture and thrombosis by a similar mechanism but with a greater intensity. It causes vasospasm even in the normal coronary arteries. Ethanol, acute ethanol intoxication is one of the major culprit which causes coronary artery disease in young subset. Diabetes and hyperlipidemia are also frequently present. Familial clustering of lipoprotein little. Even the first degree relatives of these patients have been found to have a high level of lipoprotein. Insulin dependent diabetes mellitus is found only in 10, 15 to 20 percent of all young coronary artery disease patients. Homocysteinemia, elevated fibrinogen, abnormal blood viscosity, these are other risk factors. Recent data suggests that elevated homocysteine and elevated lipoprotein are independent risk factors for development of coronary artery disease in young men. However, these two factors appear to interact in a synergistic fashion to confer risk in young women. Tunkal obesity, high body mass index, hypercoagulable state and certain connective tissue disorders or collagen vascular disorder are also etiological factors though in a rarer etiological uh, incidences. Familial history. Family history in the subset of patients like family history of diabetes, lipid disorders, thrombotic disorders, behavioral predisposition to smoking, clustering of members with lipoprotein, high lipoprotein and low level of HDL3 and apoid A2. These family risk factors do carry major uh, impact on the young coronary artery disease. Both male and female siblings are equally affected. Hypertension and lack of exercise, these two are traditional risk factors in normal coronary artery disease but these established risk factors appear to contribute only marginally in young coronary artery disease population. Emotional stress, anger, sudden physical exertion, these are unexplored area in young CAD. Coronary artery calcium needs further study in young population and inflammation, infection and vasculitis, they are under study. Usually young females are protected uh, from coronary artery disease at a younger age because of the effects of estrogen. But once the diabetes sets in, women have a more powerful role for coronary artery disease than in men. Smoking also is, a, is like diabetes. A woman who smoke have a quantitatively similar risk as men, five times the risk of non-smoking women and smoking in combination of OCPs as a 13-fold increase in coronary artery disease mortality in young females. So the data from the Western literature says that how the extent of atherosclerosis and prognosis is there in young coronary artery disease. Usually they carry a good prognosis up to three years after diagnosis. There is less extensive coronary artery disease, high rejection fraction than older MI patient. They have few comorbidities as older age patient and lesser recurrent danger and heart failure but if properly treated. The presentation with symptomatic CAD but without acute infarction is uncommon. There are two sets of population we find in young coronary artery disease. One with a single vessel disease is because of the plaque rupture, carries excellent prognosis, preserved LV function is there, lack of multiple lesions. Other side is multiple disease, multivessel disease which is less common in younger age population. It is because of the plaque rupture with familial etiologies like diabetes and uh, other etiologies. They have a more rapid progression and multivessel disease, but they carry long prognosis is very bad. The largest study was there which had a 15 year follow up which was in contradiction had shown that the 30 year mortality is very high in young coronary artery disease if they have presented with MI. They have predicted certain mortality predictors 
like diabetes, smoking, prior MI and heart failure. If they are there in a young population with ACS, then they carry a bad prognosis. Medically managed patient had worse outcome than early PCI or CABG. One have to understand that it is not the angina class or number of vessel which are involved at the time of presentation, but it is the speed of progression of the disease which is more important for a long term consequences of this disease. Pathogenic mechanisms are as we all know in a single culprit region is because of the plaque rupture on previously non-significant vulnerable plaque. They have enhanced shear forces and substantial vaso com components superimposed on a genetic predisposition to vulnerable plaque. Multivessel disease when associated with diabetes and lipid abnormalities have a rapid progression. The interaction is because various genetics and acquired mechanisms are there. And short term benefits of revascularization are there but long term prognosis is not good. How young coronary artery disease in Indians behave? Indians basically we behave totally differently. CAD has ep epidemic in India and has entered into an epidemiological transition phase. At present 25% death among Indians are attributed to CAD. With the present trend mortality of coronary artery disease with increase will increase by 103% in male and 90% in female from 1985 to 2015. And by 2015, it will account for 34% all male death and 32% all female death in India. So why are we worried? We are worried because more than one-fifth of the world population lives in India and more than 15 million Asian lives outside India. Even those who have migrated to other countries, even the male physician who were born in India and migrated to United States in three, has three to four times higher chances of prevalence of young coronary artery disease. There are four times higher hospitalization of CAD in Asian Indians, five times higher than that of other Asians. In one study in Trinidad, the incidence of CAD per 1000 person per year was found to be 16.4 in men of Indian descent, 6.8 in African descent, 6.2 of European descent and 2.4 of mixed descent. The standardized mortality ratio for CAD among Asian Indian male in UK is twice the national average in age group of 30 to 40 and it is three times higher in age group of 20 to 30 despite universal access to the similar medical conditions. Asian women are also not so bad. Those who are <coughs> immigrant women, Indian immigrant women in, in UK it has 1.5 times higher chances than other British natives and 2.6 times are in immigrant American women. The study from South Africa also states that it's four times are in US women, 14 times are in French and then French and 21 times are than that of the Japanese women. Now, the study from Malaysia, which was an angiographic study of less than 40 years of age, they found that 56% were of Asian Indian origin. The, the similar study from Qatar said that 23% were under age of 40 years of age and of these 71 percent were Asian Indians. So we Indians when we present with a young CAD we have a common we commonly manifest at an earlier age usually a decade earlier and the incidence is around 12 to 4 percent as I previously said. Indian in 30 to 39 years have 10 times higher risk of MI than other age of, of this other uh, ethnic group. There is high prevalence of metabolic and diabetic dietary risk factors even among school going children. Age standardized mortality ratio for CAD is 313 times higher in age group of 20 to 29 years as compared to whites. We have extensive triple vessel disease than the western world. Myocardial infarction is a common presentation. There is a rising trend of CAD as you see from 1962 onwards. It, the graph is gradually going up. The presentation with MI, we find that young coronary artery disease usually present with directly with a uh, myocardial infarction. The data says that less than 40 years of age, 25% will present with uh, acute MI. Less than 45, there is chance of 40% presentation with MI. 55% present with acute MI in less than 50 years of age. And 67 in less than 55 years of age. Again, an analysis of coronary risk factors. Once we analyze these coronary risk factors, they often fail to correlate with other uh, uh, country people 
like in spite of their whining and dining habits france has the lowest rate of coronary artery disease in europeans that is lower rate of cad in is visible among japanese and chinese despite high rate of smoking and hypertension in american and african countries the incidence of cad is lower despite high prevalence of obesity diabetes hypertension elevated lpa and low social economic status in african countries prevalence of cad is higher in india despite lower prevalence of smoking hypertension elevated cholesterol as compared to other western countries obesity and high prevalence of spiritual faith and vegetarianism as for the framingham study 30 to 35% of indians with cad lack traditional risk factors except diabetes mellitus which is which is higher in indian subset there is a higher rate of uh, triple vessel disease among indians and asian indian women with angiographically documented coronary artery disease the frequency of tvd was 35% in non smoking premenopausal women and 57 in post menopausal 35% is a younger age, in that is in younger age population so why are we so prone we indians are basically higher insulin resistant there is a his, uh, host of other metabolic abnormalities longer list we have a lower threshold of triglyceride and ldl c to produce cad mean triglyceride at 20 to 40 mg per day is lower than the caucasians nevertheless hdl c is also less there is a lipid quartet index which 10000 is a uh, desirable range 10 to 20 is borderline more than 20 is high risk we indians fall in a range of 12 to 20000 range indian phenotype is hypertriglyceridemia low ldl high small dense ldl high apoe low level of apoe1 the traditional risk factors however serum cholesterol hypertension cigarette smoking diabetes they do not explain the malignant nature of coronary disease in young there are higher level of apolipoprotein and recent study has found that lower level of testosterone were recently in a younger population of asian in with cad and insulin resistance lpa carries major independent risk factors for premature cad especially with high level of ldl c indians have higher ldl lipoprotein levels as compared to other country people it leads to both thrombosis and atherosclerosis there is increase in 15% per capita of fat and oil consumption mainly saturated fatty acid and we consume more calories by saturated fatty acid so as an indian scenario we have high atheroma in high infarct size high peak ck and high degree of lv dysfunction and massive mi the prognosis usually depends on uh the progression of disease extent of cad degree of left ventricular dysfunction and enter descending artery involvement we indians are different because we pre- our presentation is more malignant 40% present for the first time with mi we have rapid progression more number of arteries and more lv dysfunction with a poor outcome management as we know is primary and secondary prevention and the future is about gene therapy so our responsibility as a clinician is to contain combat and minimize this disease to create less morbidity and mortality thank you i am going to discuss about uh, what are the differences as far as coronary artery disease or rightly said ischemic heart disease in women is concerned if you look to the standards of us mortality has fallen significantly well in males since 1980 till now because of cardiovascular disease but unfortunately it has not fallen in female that was a very important alarming point if we talk about india mortality and prevalence of coronary artery disease in both sexes is going up and is not taken name to come down but this was a very important alarming point a very another important point is acute mi mortality is much higher in females you can look at these two charts blue line is for females this is for males and particularly so in young females those females who are less than 60 years the risk of death during acute mi hospitalization is much higher than male not only that even one year death rate for females as well as uh, reinfarction rate is pretty higher there are so many points behind this but still the gap is largely not understandable by us contrary to this the higher prevalence of coronary artery disease the persistent high mortality still the perception of females as what is number one killing factor or what is number one killing disease to them is still a cancer most of the females believe that it is breast cancer or cervical cancer which is going to kill them while the reality is different it is the coronary artery disease which is in fact going to kill them to majority so misperception by females 
leading to missed opportunities of treatment and ultimately there is excess inequalities. If you look, because of all atypical symptoms and impaired perception, many women seek medical care later and once they present to the medical system, maybe ER or doctor, they are many times misdiagnosed. They may have coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease, but they are understood to have some psychological issues or muscular pain or acidity. They are more likely to have various comorbidities and which make them prone for adverse outcomes. They are less likely to have an ECG in ER when they are present with some non-specific symptoms and that's all led to false sense of security in women. So what are the factors leading to this huge prevalence and mortality and problems? We all know that all risk factors work equally well in female and male to good extent, but we need to rest upon certain new and emerging risk factors if you really want to understand the coronary artery disease in women. Smokers. Those ladies who smoke have two to six times higher risk of heart attack as compared to those who do not smoke. And as was mentioned in previous talk, the ladies who smoke and take ossipals, their risk of cardiac disease and death is very, very high. Similarly, higher the BMI, higher the risk of CHD mortality in women as well as male. And a very important analysis which was published in New England Journal of Medicine way back was those ladies who gain 10 kg or more weight after than teenage, the risk of CHD increases and that is an unfortunate story in India most of the ladies do gain more than 10 kg weight after teenage and they are predisposed to huge amount of coronary artery disease. With impairment of metabolic status there is more chance of death and more chance of major adverse coronary events. Look at here diabetic ladies live worse as compared to ladies with metabolic syndrome as compared to ladies who are normal. So metabolic syndrome and diabetes do predispose women towards higher risk of coronary artery disease. Triglyceride, whatever the level may be, it impacts more on women as compared to men. So look at here, triglyceride 150, the risk of coronary artery disease and death because of that is higher in women as compared to men. So it can be true for any level of triglyceride, meaning to say that when you see high triglyceride in a lady, please be more careful on that. HDL is also equally more important in women because it has been very well documented that with every one milligram increase in HDL, 3% decrease in CHD risk for women as compared to 2% decrease in men. So lipid profile has some different impact. Putting all the risk factors together and looking at their impact on coronary artery disease in two sexes, look at here, diabetes, obesity and smoking, these three risk factors have larger impact on women as compared to men. So when you see a lady with diabetes, obesity and those ladies who smoke, you have to be more careful as far as primary and secondary prevention is concerned. Healthy lifestyle, there is no alternative on this earth so far, whatever said and done, whatever medicines and interventions are invented, look at here, very important point, those ladies who have a habit of daily walking or any kind of physical exercise, their risk of cardiovascular disease is significantly less as compared to ladies who do not have a habit of exercise. And similar is for the healthy diet, those who do not take healthy diet versus those who take perfectly healthy diet, the cardiovascular risk is significantly reduced. So these simple measures help a lot. We all know that Framingham risk score is a good risk assessment system and should be applied to all females as well as males, but there are certain limitations like they predict the outcome for next 10 years as well as they do not include the family history of premature CID. So at least in females we need to have additional novel risk markers to further risk stratify them. If you go by just Framingham risk score, most of the women are placed either in optimum risk or low risk, while hardly 2% or less women are placed in high risk. The actual story is not so. So that's why you need something in addition to routine measures of risk assessment and this additional novel markers as we will explain in next few slides like inflammatory markers that is CRP, retinal artery narrowing or coronary calcification on CT scan are extremely helpful. So when you see a lady as a patient presenting with any kind of non-specific symptoms where you suspect coronary artery disease, to really look into, you need to combine a lot of things, not only clinical history, but you need to take into consideration the functional capacity, plaque burden, extent and severity of perfusion abnormalities, ejection fraction, inflammatory markers, etc. Look at here, this is a very important slide. We all know that total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol ratio is a very important marker of disease. If the ratio is very favorable, total cholesterol, say for example, is less than 150, HDL is more than 50, the ratio is pretty favorable, if you look to this ratio only, the risk is very, very low for coronary artery disease. But in the same group, if you add HSCRP, in the same group, those ladies who have high HSCRP or very high HSCRP, their risk is pretty high. So if you look to cholesterols only, you will stratify these ladies as low risk, but if you do additional HSCRP, you may put so many ladies into high or intermediate risk. So they work together and that's why we need certain novel risk markers. 
Not only that, psychosocial stress in women also is very, very important, not only in Western countries, but also in India. A very interesting study, sorry male guys here, among women who were married or cohabitating with male partners, marital stress was associated with nearly threefold increased risk of recurrent CHD. So just having a husband increases risk of recurrent CHD. And as compared to that, ladies who prefer to live alone and keep on doing jobs, their risk of recurrent event was not increased. And depression is an independent risk factor in ladies and male as well. Anemia, a very important point in India, 90% of the women in India are anemic. And anemia in patients who present with acute MR or heart failure are frequently associated with adverse outcome. There is plenty of data. One very important study called as WISE did show anemic women had a higher chance of all-cause death. So that is very important that anemia, though, is a simple point, but does contribute to a lot of mortality and risk in ladies. Exercise ECG has less sensitivity and specificity in ladies because of the resting STT wave abnormalities and because of hormonal influences. But a very important point which you can derive out of TMT is look at how many meds a lady can complete. Those ladies who can finish eight meds, if you put their risk of cardiovascular disease or death as one, those who cannot complete five meds, their risk is pretty high, two to three times. So functional capacity on treadmill test for a lady is a prognostic marker, and that's very important. So when next time onwards, when you send a lady for treadmill test, look at that, how many meds she has completed. Stress echocardiography is little better than stress ECG. There is more accuracy and more sensitivity. But maybe, say, uh, scans, that is perfusion imaging, particularly not thallium, but technetium, is more important in ladies. But still, in women, overall accuracy is little less as compared to men because of a lot of issues like breast attenuation, etc. Coronary calcification by CT scan is an important tool, has got very high sensitivity, and that's why the negative predictive value is pretty high. Absence of calcification on coronary arteries on CT scan does put a lady towards low risk as far as coronary artery disease is concerned. And this tool is particularly useful in ladies whom you think intermediate risk. The ladies whom you think absolutely low risk, clinical profile is fine, no major issues, you may not send them. Ladies who have already high risk, you have to start accordingly. But the ladies who are intermediate risk, you can get them for CT scan, but you have to be very judicious because there is data that by CT scan you may predispose them to towards malignancy. Now again, look at what is the importance of calcification score on CT scan. These are the ladies as compared to men, and they have been risk stratified by Framingham risk score into low, intermediate, or high. Now in the same ladies where you say that the risk is low, if you do cal calcification and if calcification score is very high, the risk is high. So even those ladies who are by Framingham risk score considered as low risk, but if they have got more calcification on CT scan, they are high risk. Similar is the story for intermediate zone. So many ladies from intermediate risk category, if you look only clinical aspects, can be placed in high risk if you do CT calcium. So CT calcium in ladies who are intermediate risk is absolutely a vital thing. What about outcomes in stable and unstable disease? We all know that the ladies who present with stable chest pain symptoms, their cardiac survival and prognosis is little superior to men because of variety of reasons which I'll discuss. But in acute MI, the prognosis is very bad for ladies because one-year death rate and reinfarction rate is much higher in ladies. There are so many issues like comorbidities, infarct severity, and management intensities, but still, as I told you, the gap between the prognosis in men and women is not very well understood. While ladies who present with unstable symptoms, many of them will have so-called normal coronary arteries, and their prognosis is same as male, which actually should be better because of more chance of normal coronary arteries. Women and heart failure, they are more frequently admitted for congestive heart failure symptoms with preserved LV function, so-called as previously diastolic dysfunction. A large number of ladies, particularly those who are elderly, hypertensive, and maybe diabetic, present with this scenario. Paradoxically, they are more likely to die. Now, this is a very important point. Preserved LV function, symptoms of heart failure, and still there is more chance of death. And compared to men, women with heart failure have more chance of having various comorbidities. What about women and revascularization? A lot of data is there. Maybe things are improving, but still, after CABG, operative mortality is higher for women in part due to excessive rates of heart failure. So still, even after CABG, the mortality is high, and women have a more difficult recovery after CABG. Roughly, the story has been the same for angioplasty also, but off late, the results have been improving in women. And a very important point, women receive relatively less symptom relief with whatever reverse procedure you do. Even after angioplasty or bypass, they, will, they may keep on explaining that they have symptoms 
and there may be objective evidence of ischemia also and impaired functional capacity is an eternal problem as far as ladies are concerned. So this is called as typical female coronary disease. There are three important features about this. Greater symptom burdens, they have huge kind of variety of symptoms, typical, atypical, persistent symptoms, long term symptoms, fatigue, dyspnea, whatsoever. So huge symptomatic burden. If you do angiography, they may have normal, so called normal coronary angiograms, so less angiographic disease burden and their adverse outcomes is definitely more than male. So a model has been proposed which is for the typical female coronary artery disease and I, I will take a minute to explain this. This is called as microvascular angina in women. The science is very clear, now sex hormones influence fat deposition and distribution, insulin sensitivity and resistance, lipid metabolism, coagulation factors and inflammation. So there is a huge role or likely role of sex hormones. We all know that, we all know that a lady after menopause has a deficiency of estrogen. Not only that, even so many premenopausal ladies, they do have polycystic ovarian syndrome or polycystic ovarian disease. They might have certain episodes where they have irregular periods. So it has been said 10 to 40 percent ladies will keep on having relative estrogen deficiency even before menopause. And this is a very important point. In the background of hormonal alteration, variety of traditional risk factors come together like hyperlipidemia, hypertension, smoking, metabolic syndrome and all these atherogenic factors become more inflammatory in ladies. Now this is very very important point. Similar risk factors become more inflammatory or they provoke more inflammatory response in ladies because of the estrogen lack and all this together leads to what is called as microvascular dysfunction. See, if you do angiogram, you may not get very obstructive lesions and many a times angiogram is reported to be normal, no obstructive coronary artery disease. But symptoms keep on occurring in these ladies, particularly when they are under stress due to impaired flow reserve out of diastolic dis and endothelial dysfunction and a relatively small caliber vessels. So what happens for ladies is they have relatively small caliber vessels, more positive remodeling, they may not have obstructive disease but they keep on having symptoms and that's why it's very, very important that we look at these ladies very carefully. Science and fraternity has always done a lot of injustice to ladies and that's also right in medical field. There has been loss, less cholesterol screening, less lipid treatment, less use of heparin, beta blockers, aspirin, thrombolysis, less chance of primary plasty, less chance of bypass, less antiplatelet therapy, fewer referrals for cardiac rehab, fewer implantable cardiac defibrillators. Unfortunate story, we need to improve this. So coming to conclusions in last minute, number one, females do have typical disease. The signs and symptoms of IHD are more complex and multifactorial. Traditional diagnostic tests which focus on identifying obstructive disease do not work well in females. You have to go for additional risk assessment by CRP and CT scan. Estrogen lack is a hallmark and please do not ignore non-obstructive coronary artery disease in female. What is most important, just 10 seconds is assess the risk, good lifestyle, look for other interventions, high priority to highest risk ladies and please don't do three things, no antioxidant to ladies, no hormone replacement therapy, no aspirin for low risk ladies. Thank you very much. The full form of CACS is coronary artery calcium scoring. This is going to a very good clinical tool. I would say it's not a, another investigation in the existing basket of so many investigation, but it's a risk factor. Why we want to know whether the patient is having diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia? Because we want to reduce the risk. So, if we know there is a coronary calcification, definitely we can make a difference. That's what I am going to just tell you in brief about the coronary artery calcification in next few minutes. If I finish very fast, it will take some time to have answer and question. So, the Sons was a great scientist, he was a great cardiologist. I still remember what he has said, we are still living in a world where almost one third of the patient who die, who die suddenly before we were even aware that these people were ill or that their lives were in jeopardy. So it seems to me that the most important problem we face is to find out a way of recognizing these people before they drop to dead or tell us that they were sick. With that thought, it came, there are so many risk factors which we don't know still. So we have to continue looking for the other risk factor so that we can reduce the cardiac mortality. Still we know almost 50% of the patient present to us, they just come with the sudden cardiac death, cardiac arrest before having any prior predominating symptom. So the coronary artery calcification is one of them. 
we all know when we were born our coronaries were like this there was no plaque no calcification nothing but slowly when we get aged because of stress because of sedentary lifestyle because of dietary habit we start putting on the plaque in our coronaries and slowly what happen our coronaries get slowly and slowly narrowed and lot of deposition of the atheromatous plaque and subsequently this plaque get necros and on the top of that necros atheromatous plaque there is a deposition of the calcium so calcium is not a degenerative problem it's a aging problem it's a dystrophic calcification on the existing atheromatous plaque so understand if there is a calcification there definitely there is a some plaque in the coronaries or in any vascular system so slowly what happen more and more plaque burden the more and more calcium deposition it's not vice versa that more the calcium more will be the atheromatous plaque almost 20% of the coronary plaque is formed by the calcification one way the calcium is very helpful because what the calcium does it stabilizes the plaque it produces very thick fibrotic calcific plaque which prevents from development of the acute coronary syndrome but unfortunately most of the patient which we see in acute coronary syndrome they come here because of the very thin fibrocalcific plaque any cap less than 65 microgram is very prone for rupture any stress any kind of uh, distress to the body will cause rupture of this fibrocalcific plaque and the patient will present as a acute coronary syndrome once there will be rupture of plaque there will be formation of thrombus and there will be complete occlusion of the vessel so with the calcification we are not going to look this kind of patient but we are going to predict this kind of patient who have atheromatous plaque there are lot of calcium and we want to reduce the risk of coronary event and we can even find out this kind of portion, proportion of patient also if there is a atheromatous plaque there is going to be calcification and we can pick up the calcification at very early age so this was the thought behind having this lecture on the acute coronary syndrome so how to determine this calcification it's just a just simple very simple procedure just do a ct scan it's a simple ct scan machine which detect the coronary calcium the gentry moves around 360 degree to the patient and that detect the calcium so how to report the calcium how to see there will be hyperatinetic plaque or something say hyperatinetic picture which you will see in the ct scan this is how the calcium looks like the scan can be done less in less than 20 second the radiation exposure is very minimal 1 to 1.3 msv and the acquisition time takes less than 100 millisecond and the standard protocol the standard calcification scoring was described by agustin which i am going to tell you how to derive the score and the total procedure takes less than 15 to 20 minutes so the coronary calcium any hyperatinetic lesion above the threshold of 130 house uh, hansfold unit with an area of 3 or more will consider as a calcific spot in the ct scan and how to derive this calcium score the area of calcification per coronary crest cross section multiply by factor 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 depend upon the maximum calcium present in the one particular coronary section let's see this if there is area of calcification is 15 mill, uh, mill, mm square the peak calcium is 450 so if you see 450 it will be multiplied by 4 and the total score will be 60 here let's say the area is 8 mm square the peak calcium is 290 so score will be 16 but you don't have to calculate the score the machine will calculate for you you just have to interpret it so now how to interpret the calcium scoring zero no calcium none 1 to 99 there is a mild calcification 100 to 400 this is a moderate calcification and more than 400 it's a severe calcification as i told you the presence of calcium does not say there is a stenotic but higher the calcification there is a high chance that patient will be having the stenotic coronary artery disease so more the calcium there is a higher chance that patient will be having stenotic coronary artery disease it is very interesting paper the largest retrospective study which found more than 5000 patients which were follow over 37 months and what they found out 
the odds ratio for coronary artery calcium was highest you look at the all the other factor aging smoking elevated cholesterol diabetes mellitus hypertension if you combine all these the risk or the odds ratio for the acute coronary event or coronary death is highest with the coronary artery calcification so if you detect the coronary artery calcification at very early stage you can make a difference so overall if you see the meta analysis there was seven studies published more than 14000 patients and all studies and found out that coronary artery calcification can predict the cardiovascular mortality at very early age and you can make the difference so who should we scan should we scan patient with all general population or one or two risk factor or symptomatic patient or with a low risk patient with 10 year mortality less than 10% or to the intermediate risk group or to the high risk group so if we scan for all general public who has symptom or no symptom or low risk patient it is not justified because the economic burden will be more than doing the justice high risk patient anyway we are going to do the other investigations so this uh, this populations also don't require the calcium scoring but to me the looks like intermediate risk population which has a 10 year risk of 10 to 20% should go for coronary artery calcium scoring and what to do about after getting the scoring if 0 to 10, 10 just reassure them and and uh, enforce for the lifestyle modification if 11 to 99 give the aspirin as a primary prevention 100 to 400 enforce for the lifestyle modification secondary prevention and consider other stress imaging which can pick up the stenotic lesion more than 400 definitely you have to be very aggressive you need other investigation to find out whether the patient has coronary artery disease or stenotic coronary artery disease so don't misunderstand me here that if no calcium we are free we are safe if calcification we are having the atherosclerotic disease it's not the vice versa let's take one scenario 64 year old male patient with typical angina of recent onset understand angina of recent onset he is having dyslipidemia he is hypertensive but no diabetes and no tobacco use negative stress test which was done previously the recent stress echo shows septal hypokinesia at rest with ef normal and he was referred for calcium scoring i don't know why this patient was referred for calcium scoring based on the scenario but anyway this patient was referred for the coronary calcium scoring and you uh, see the coronary is no calcification at all very smooth no hyperatonic lesion at all and our radiologist who has given very nice report calcium volume zero but please correlate clinical it is a line which we always see in some investigation so we have to decide which patient should go for which investigation look at the history again typical angina of recent onset having two risk factor septal hypokinesia crest i think this patient should not go for the calcium scoring i think he should go for the other modalities of investigation i have doubt whether this scoring was normal or not i took the cd myself i analyzed this and you see there is a soft plaque there is a narrowing here but there is no calcification so fresh thrombus fresh occlusion will not have the calcification chronic occlusion chronic thrombus chronic atherosclerotic plaque will have the calcification you see there is a tight critical lesion in led and this patient was sent for the pci and see there is a in the right coronary artery again there is a obstructive disease but there is no calcification at all and how this calcification looks in ct this is the calcification so the presence of calcification suggests there is a chronicity of the disease but it may not rule out the acute coronary event so all patient if you want to see whether there is a extensive atherosclerosis sent for the calcium scoring so which test for which patient all modalities are improved we know there are so many investigation which are getting better and better no single modality is fit for all the patient and choice of initial test depend upon the specific clinical question or clinical examination otherwise what will happen there is no use of doctor patient will go directly to the investigate lab he will get this uh, calcium scoring and he will see the internet and what i have to do and he will treat himself so here the clinical application is very very important so in conclusion i would say the coronary artery calcium is a strong predictor of future coronary event may improve risk prediction beyond the traditional risk factor it can be useful in the reclassification of individual at the intermediate risk it is not recommended for the low risk group as at present 
and in the future i think it may improve the risk prediction in atp3 guideline which involve the high risk individual if they have the calcium scoring thank you so much i will be talking on cimt so basically uh, i mean the concept is we treat arteries instead of risk factors what we are doing till now and as all of you are very aware, very well aware that atherosclerosis is a it's 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 a gradual process it begins at very early age in initial phase the atheroma is non occlusive patient is asymptomatic and by the time patient becomes symptomatic atheroma burden is very high and patient will end up with either cvd or cerebrovascular disease or peripheral vascular disease now the challenge is to identify the patient at this asymptomatic stage not here what we have been doing since long right so the <clears throat> focus has to be shifted to primary prevention which is defined as prevention of the first occurrence of cvd but it requires early identification of individuals who are at risk of developing cv disease but who are clinically asymptomatic and if we can identify these people we can initiate intensive preventive measures and prevent development of cvd and for that the established approach has been risk factor mediated that is risk factor certification these risk factors have been identified and uh, it has been advised that if you can modify this then in the favor of the patient uh, individual then you can d uh, definitely decrease the odds ratio of developing cvd right and a uh, framingham risk score we are all aware and uh, that is basically the risk of having heart attack or dying of heart disease within 10 years if it is less than 10% then patient is at low risk 10 to 20% is medium risk and at uh, more than 20% then patient is at high risk and this is calculated based on number of risk factor a particular individual is having now acc and aha recommends that the the uh, lifestyle measures uh, should begin at very early age because atherosclerosis presumably starts very early and if you can achieve favorable risk profile then it is asso associated with longer and healthier life in when patient is old but the achievement of targets that for example blood pressure or cholesterol is very difficult to achieve as you can see from this meta analysis across the globe that more than 50% of the patients are not uh, uh, reaching to target blood pressure or target cholesterol level similarly the cessation of smoking is not seen in quite a high number of patients so we need to have some diagnostic modalities the modalities currently we have been using like tmt or stress eco or thelium or angiography they detect atherosclerosis at late stage and risk factor assessment scores as we as we discussed they definitely predict the risk of future cv events but they fail to identify the ongoing atherosclerotic process that means there is no objective evidence of atherosclerosis so we need to have a good screening test which is accurate reliable and who can which can detect individuals where early intervention is likely to have beneficial effect and should provide incremental value to the risk predicted by the office based risk assessment right so number of this imaging markers have been i mean studied uh, uh, dr gupta already discussed uh, 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 ct scan calcium scoring and we will be discussing the method of Uh, uh, using b mode ultrasonography which has been approved by american society of echocardiography that is called as carotid intima media thickness right and this is a ultrasound based method which is non invasive sensitive and reproducible for identifying and qu quantifying disease and risk and this is the area of interest common carotid artery just before the bifurcation and uh, the question is why cimt the answer and the answer to that question is because atherosclerosis is a generalized process and it affects all arterial beds the including carotid and coronaries so if you find atherosclerosis in carotids then it should reflect coronary involvement also and this fact has been confirmed histologically and extracranial carotid arteries they provide excellent and reproducible sites 
for this CIMT assessment because of their easy accessibility, adequate size and limited movements. And studies have endorsed that raised carotid CIMT is an excellent predictor of the risk of future CV events and it can detect the presence of CAD. So it has got many benefits. It refines CVD risk assessment, reclassifies the patients with intermediate risk. This is very important. As Dr. Satya Gupta told that low risk patients, we are not interested because uh, they are anyhow low risk. High risk patient, we are going to initiate intensive measures. But for intermediate risk group patients, we need to reclassify. We need to identify high risk among this group. Right? So if you can identify this, you can initiate early therapy and prevent death and morbidity from CVD. Right? Now, which are the target populations for CIMT? As I said, intermediate group in Framingham risk score 10 to 20 percent. Moreover, patients who have got family history of premature CVD in first degree relative at relatively young age and male patients who are less than 60 years of old with at least one risk factor. For example, 60 year old male patient who is a chronic smoker who otherwise does not uh, qualify for the intensive treatment. But if CIMT is done and, and it is significantly high, you can initiate intensive uh, treatment, medical treatment in these patients. And in, in women, if it is more than 60 years of, of younger than 60 year, then at least two risk factors and high CIMT as an indication that they are into a high risk category. Now this is the anatomy of the <coughs> carotid arteries. All of you are very much aware of that. The, on, on the left side there is a brachiocephalic, on the right side there is a brachiocephalic trunk which divides into right subclavian and right common carotid and on left side the cor common carotid artery arises from the aortic arc itself, right? And this carotid, common carotid artery divides into internal carotid and external carotid artery and this is our area of interest for measuring the CIMT. The technique, basically IMT is distance between luminal, lumen intima interface and media advent, adventitia interface. So this is the area uh, where you measure CIMT and uh, how to measure it. The sonographer is at the head, on the head end of the patient, right? And the patient is on supine, his, his neck or his or her neck is hyperextended on the opposite side and this is how it should be measured. Uh, normally linear ultrasound probe uh, a frequency of 7, 7 megahertz is used and this is the scanning sequence. I will not go into detail. You have to take transverse uh, scan, longitudinal scan, Doppler recordings and then CIMT imaging. Distal 1 centimeter of common carotid artery just before bifurcation should be used. Far wall is preferred and images taken are at 3 angles and they are to be they have to be measured on both sides and then average it normal value is different from both men and women for different ages and average imt value if it is more than 0.8 millimeter then it is associated with increased risk in most studies and if it is more than 1 millimeter then there is high incidence of cv events irrespective of age gender and race as you can see here this is normal intima and this is the thick intima. And these are the examples. Uh, high uh, IMT of 0.4 millimeter, as you can see, very thin IMT. This is intermediate 0.69. And this is, as you can see, patient who is having very high IMT, more than 1 millimeter. So basically, it, it is a quantitative index of atherosclerosis. You can see atherosclerosis. Objective evidence is there. And it gives a comprehensive picture of deleterious effects of various risk factors which have been accumulated over decades. It is the only marker that directly detects and assesses physical presence of atherosclerosis. Now, these are some of the trials which shows that IMT, this is the ERIC trial which shows that IMT more than 0.8 millimeter, the CHD events is pretty high and similar finding was uh, shown in Rotterdam study and again cardiovascular health study shows that the quantile of intima media thickness, when it increases, there is high incidence of CHD events. And there is also one Indian, Indian study where 101 patients with CAD were compared with 140 control subjects. And CIMT was measured. As you can see, 
the demographics were similar p value is insignificant in both this group and this study showed that maximum and average intima media thickness was significantly higher in coronary artery disease group and uh, on multivariate logistic regression analysis uh, as you can see cimt was the only factor th that was independent predictor of coronary artery disease in both this group p value is statistically significant so these results indicate that raised value of cimt significantly associated with presence of cad independent of other presence or absence of other risk factors it has the advantage of stability and reflects the extent of the disease and it is easily applicable and non invasive so should be the investigation of choice an editorial on european heart journal was published way back in 2002 that common carotid artery imt is nearly as predictive as future of future of cv events as all of the following nine risk factors combined together so if you know nothing else about an individual except the imt value of cca you would be able to correctly identify the same fraction of subject as you could assess by assessing all the risk factors combined together so what is the application in clinical practice so in clinical practice you conventionally risk assessment should be done of the patient if patient is in the high risk high risk then uh, cimt has the role of improving patient compliance as we can see later and monitoring the response to treatment and in intermediate risk group patients you can further risk stratify and uh, identify the high risk among this and also it helps in improving patient compliance and monitoring the response of the treatment so in intermediate risk risk group of patients if cimt is, is high then patient should be considered high risk if it is low then it should be treated as a low risk patient and interpretation interpretation should be like this if it is cimt is more than 75th percentile then it is increased risk between 25 to 75 it is unchanged risk and less than 25 that means there is a decreased risk and uh, as i said if you know cimt it favorably improves physician that is your yours as well as patient behavior as you can see from this article when detected physicians are more likely to prescribe aspirin and statins and subjects were likely to report increase in plans so basically they they are likely to take these medicines more regularly than uh, uh, the patients who have not seen the cimt images so smokers shown images of carotid plaques are more likely to stop smoking so you can change the behavior of the patients also and patients are more likely to either to recommendations recommendations of diet exercise and smoking suggestions so you can motivate your patients and treatment strategy should be like this if cimt is uh, in the lower range and then the treatment strategy should be lifestyle modification and ldl cholesterol goal little bit higher if the patient is in high risk cimt is more than one with no i mean less than 50% of stenosis then uh, ldl cholesterol goal should be little bit more aggressive and in very high risk patients who have got also carotid artery stenosis then you can consider uh, myocardial ischemia testing also cimt also helps in monitoring the response to uh, treatment with rosuvastatin we now have uh, effect of plaque regression and this can also be assessed with cimt and as i said the most important use of cimt should should be to motivate the patient to reduce risk factors for example 30 year, you have a 32 year old male patient who is unable to quit quit smoking despite your despite your repeated attempts but if you do cimt and then you tell the patients that although you are 32 years of age your vascular age is equal to 60 year old in that way you can motivate your patient to uh, change his lifestyle and uh, you can ask him question that you, this is 38 or male patient whose cimt is 0.84 and this is 68 year old gentleman cimt 0.58 and you can ask him that who is older huh? by vascular age you are 68 years and this gentleman is 38 years thank you very much davi means uh, transcatheter aortic valve implant which is better now known as transcatheter aortic valve replacement tavr so basically i'll go very rapidly about this 
We know that normal aortic valve is a tricuspid valve, thin leaflet, and they get affected by rheumatic disease, which is right lower corner, or it can be just degenerative calcific aortic stenosis, where calcium is deposited here, and this is a bicuspid aortic valve. So basically, when we talk about percutaneous aortic valve implant, these two subsets are actually not suitable cases, and it is usually done for degenerative aortic uh, calcific aortic stenosis. We know that natural history of aortic stenosis, for many, many years, patient remain asymptomatic, but as the symptoms start, then survival is very, very short. If it is angina, syncope or failure, survival is just two to five years. So once symptoms start, 50% of them are dead by two years, and only 20% are alive at the end of five years. So treatment is mandatory when patient has severe aortic stenosis, and we may not wait till symptoms even appear. How to define uh, aortic stenosis severity? Any gradient which is uh, mean gradient more than 40 or peak velocity more than 4 meter per second, that is 64 meter per mercury gradient, or aortic wall area which is less than 1 is defined as severe aortic stenosis where patient warrants something. We know it by eco only, we don't need angiography for this. And we know that if we has patient has severe aortic stenosis, then long term outcome is very dismal. One year survival, even free survival on just medical management or just plain balloon aortic valvuloplasty is just 50 percent and three year survival, even free survival is just 10 percent with a simple balloon aortic valvuloplasty. So patient needs something and cardiologist started thinking of doing something percutaneously. Anderson was the first fellow in 1989, he implanted a percutaneous aortic valve uh, in a pig and then at that time surgeon started telling us like this, that cardiologists are a polite breed, we are a polite breed, so surgeons started abusing us, you are a crazy, reckless idiots, you won't get any fund because you, you want to develop something, you need fund, and can't work and will kill all the patients. Cardiologists say, okay. Ultimately, one cardiologist was there, who was very courageous, uh, Dr. Elaine Kribier from France, he, he continuously is trying to develop the wall, and in 2002, for first time in, in this world, one man who was inoperable, all surgeons had refused surgery, he implanted percutaneous aortic valve in 2002 by integrated transeptal approach and that valve was this uh, Cribier Edwards valve. So first in main valve, after that surgeons become slightly polite, idiot become irresponsible, you are merely irresponsible, procedure is too complicated, possibly inoperable patients only can be done. Surgeon, we, we are again, as I told that we, we accept whatever surgeons say, they are our big brothers. And uh, in front of a robust uh, surgeon, PAVR was like this small child. We are trying to do something in this uh, world. And surgeons told us clearly, you can do something where we cannot touch. So only patients who are hopeless and unfortunate, extreme risk or inoperable, or patient who is refusing surgery, these are the patients you can touch, otherwise it is all our job. So don't touch them. We told, okay. So then, then transcathode aortic valve replacement came. And then there was a great generation of uh, advancement, VAS become better and better, and even catheter delivery system also become better and better, and their high profile system becomes smaller and smaller. And for, there are two types of valve, one is uh, balloon implant, Im, uh, balloon implantable valve, that is Edward Sapien valve, and another is core valve by Medtronic, I'll show you in the next slide. But there are two approaches to implant this valve. If somebody has good femoral artery, then it can go percutaneously like this, we can implant the valve percutaneously through transfemoral route, but if somebody's femoral artery or aorta or aortic arch is not suitable because to introduce this valve you need at least femoral artery of 6, uh, six millimeter and artery should be free of tortuosity and calcification. So in that case, you directly open this valve. If artery is not suitable, transfemoral route is not possible, then you go transepically, you open the small small incision at the apex in the chest, in the apical area, and just put uh, aortic valve through the apex like in this diagram. Another wall is self-expanding bioprocesses, that is core wall. And core wall actually sits in the aortic root like this. And there is wall here. And coronary perfusion actually, this is ascending aorta. Coronary perfusion comes through the spaces between the stud. It comes through this into the coronary sinus, and then coronaries are perfused. So again, like Edward Sapien wall, core wall also has become better and better. Delivery system has become smaller and smaller. and uh, both, both systems are equally, I mean, they are good, there is no head to head comparison with that. So these are the steps, you go transfemoral, 
wall is crossed initially balloon it is inflated with balloon and then stand time balloon implantable wall is deployed in the aortic annulus properly and then balloon is removed and wall stays there if you go if you want route is not possible go transepically just put a small incision here 3-4 cm open I mean take a power string stitch at the apex uh, introduce a guide wire implant with the balloon predilate the wall and then put the uh, balloon implantable balloon expandable adult sapien wall here so this wall is uh, able to be put by transfemoral as well as transepical route. These are the important anatomical considerations before you take any, any patient uh, for this uh, procedure. Peripheral vasculature should be good because you have to go through femoral route and if femoral route is not available, core wall can be implanted through even subclavian artery and uh, adverse epine can go through transepical route also. Core wall cannot go through transepical route. Abdominal and thoracic aorta should be good enough to bring your wall uh, to the position. So, ascending aorta, aortic arch, abdominal aorta, thoracic aorta, everything we have to assess very carefully. And this is done by three three modalities. Echo is essential for assessment of uh, walls. Enduraph is required to assess coronary arteries, aortic root and enter aorta. And of course, multi CT scan will give nice picture of enter aorta, calcification, diameter of the peripheral vessels, subclean arteries, peripheral arteries, femoral arteries and as I told that if artery is less than 6 mm and if it is full of heavy calcification and full of tortuosity then transfemoral route is not possible then you have to select transepical route or subclavian route. So whether clinically trans wall replacement is it effective, is it safe? Partner trial was the answer for that. Uh, Martin Leo was the principal investigator and this was published in October 2010. Results of partner cohort B was published there. What was that trial? A surgeon had told us only to touch inoperable patients. So this trial was for inoperable patients where surgeon had refused and uh, surgical risk was very high. So only inoperable patients were taken. This was a trial design. Those who were inoperable patients, they were randomized to either transfemoral aortic wall replants or standard therapy which were including medical therapy plus uh, simple balloon aortic wall replasty. So these were the inclusion criteria, severe aortic stenosis, symptomatic, wall area less than 0.8, peak velocity more than 4 meter per second, peak gradient, I mean mean gradient more than 40, and NYHA function class 2 or greater, and risk of death on surgery was almost 50% as assessed by surgeons. So, and if you see, almost 92% of these patients who undergo uh, transcathodic aortic wall replant were in 92% were in class 3 to 4, so very, very sick patient. And the Society of Thoracic Surgeons score more than 10 is significant, I mean severe, then this was 11. So it was a very high risk group of population. What was the result? Compared to standard therapy, that was simple plain balloon aortic, uh, aortic valvuloplasty or plus medical therapy was uh, inferior to transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So when you do TAVR, you are reducing risk by 43% in all cause mortality. Cardiovascular mortality is also significantly reduced, 56% reduction. And repeat hospitalization was also 59% reduced. So, and functional class improvement, almost at the end of uh, one, two years actually, almost 16% were only in class 3 or 4, while here it was almost 58% who were in class 3 or 4 with standard treatment. So clearly this was the method of choice for inoperable patient. It reduces all cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality and repeat hospitalization. And uh, there was functional improvement also. So after this, we thought that is it non inferior to surgical treatment? Suppose this are inoperable patient, but if patient is operable, should we go for TAVR or surgical AVR, standard therapy? For, so for that, partner trial court A was uh, evolved. And here we discuss this, now we are discussing this. Those who are operable, but they are very high risk patient. Can we go for trans femoral or transepical aortic wall replacement? versus uh, surgical aortic wall replacement, that is standard variety which we are following at present. So both transfemoral, transepical approaches and what was the result? Compared to surgery, both were equal. All cause mortality is same with uh, transcatheter aortic wall replacement or surgical aortic wall replacement. All cause mortality for transfemoral also was same, transepical was also same. Stroke was also same, I mean com combination of mortality pro stroke composite endpoint same, functional improvement at the end of one year also was same. And if you take 6 minute walk test, that was also same at the end of one year. So you do surgical wall replacement or transcatheter aortic wall replacement, everything is same. Eco findings, 
gradient reduction, whether it's surgery or transcatheter aortic valve replacement, same. So, what are implications? TAVA has already become a standard care and actually in Europe at present I think 40 percent of aortic valve replacements are done by this technique. So, what are future direction? You can go transepical aortic valve replacement and even mitral valve replacement, wall in wall can be done without surgery. These are the future valves available. When we do transcatheter aortic valve implant, you may throw some debris in the, in the brain and patient can get stroke and that is one major concern. And to prevent that, we, uh, there are various filter devices which are put in aort, uh, aortic arch or in the carotid to prevent uh, debris to go in the brain and to prevent a stroke during the procedure. So these are also there. So what surgeons are now telling to us? In 2000, they told us uh, idiots. In 2005, they told us irresponsible. And in 2010, that they are telling that you are visionary people. You have breakthrough procedure, which is easily generalizable. You, uh, this is a better than a dream. Will transport therapy for most aortic stenosis patients. So surgeons will lose job here also. And now TAVR has become like this. And this is the longest survival. Dr. Ellen Kribius patient, longest reported clinical follow-up, 90-year-old female with 7.5 years uh, survival after the transcatheter aortic valve replacement and she is still doing well. And in 5 to 10 years, maybe all the procedures will be done by percutaneous means only. Surgery will become the past and TA will, TAVR will be the future. Actually, I was trained in, uh, for this procedure in Switzerland some 3 months back. But unfortunately, the certificate is uh, getting dust. In India, there is a rule that unless uh, something is approved by uh, DCGI, Drug Control General of India, no new device can come in the market. So DCGI, since last two years, is not giving permission for any kind of aortic, I mean, new device, aortic valve replacement, mitral clip, or anything. So we are still not able to use in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to make sure that you stay on time for the program. Having run my own program before, I know uh, what it's like to try to keep these moving, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the most exciting uh, areas for us today, moving in coronary revascularization, coronary stenting, is perhaps to move towards scaffolds or stents that are not permanently implanted in the vessel, producing a caging effect on the vessel over time, but they can resorb over time, and more or less free the artery up to become more physiologic. Um, so what I'd like to do is give you a, um, a brief overview of this in a very short period of time for a fairly complex technology, but a technology which has already entered India and has already completed uh, its evaluation, clinical evaluation in India and is under regulatory review at this point. So there are four major components of this uh, scaffold. So we're not calling it a stent anymore, it's being called a scaffold because it's a temporary device. It's made completely of polylactic acid with a PLLA backbone that resorbs over two years, a more quickly resorbing PDL uh, lactate uh, coating which resorbs over about three months. It eludes everolimus, so it's drug eluding, and it uses a, uh, a very, very uh, sophisticated balloon delivery system. Uh, this is what the polymer coating looks like. There is a polymer backbone, which is the PLLA scaffold, and then sprayed on top of it is PDLA, which is the more amorphous matrix, which eludes the drug over three months. So there are three main phases of functionality for a bioresorbable scaffold. First of all, it has to act like a stent in that it must revascularize the artery. You have to open the blockage. This is a function that you just need for a few months. Second function is restoration of vascular functions, such as vasomotion, gradually losing radial strength of the scaffold and allowing the vessel to become pulsatile again. And then thirdly is resorption, and this is full resorption of the polylactic acid, which is biologically resorbed through a process of hydrolysis, requiring no inflammation so that the scaffold uh, goes away at about two years. So is this device going to be deliverable? Is the way this, the scaffold design going to be deliverable like a stent? Well, Zyance V, which you know is one of the more uh, popular uh, non-domestic drug eluting stents in, in India, uh, and the number one stent in the world now internationally, is deliverable to this degree in a, in a simulated arterial model, and you can see the absorbed 
bioresorbable scaffold has very similar deliverability in bench models, and I've personally uh, been involved in these uh, deliverability testings. If you look at vessel support over time, will the scaffold open the artery enough and hold it open long enough, maintaining radial strength over time? And you can see compared to a metallic stent like Zyatz V, the, uh, the BVS uh, scaffold at time zero or at six months maintains excellent radial strength. In addition, this will be the most conformable stent or scaffold in the world uh, for patients because although it has good ring-to-ring -ring hoop strength or radial strength, longitudinally the scaffold is very flexible. So when implanted in a bend in a coronary artery, you know most coronaries are very tortuous, after deploying the scaffold, this is a scaffold that was placed several years ago by Dr. Sorois in the Netherlands, you can see the preservation of the angle of the curvature of the vessel almost perfectly following implantation. And this is an important part of being less invasive to the vessel. So the next phase is restoration. Now what do we mean by restoration? Well, what this means is that as the polylactic acid degrades by hydrolysis, the molecular weight drops off first, and as the molecular weight drops off, then the strength drops off, and then eventually there's mass resorption. But in this initial phase for about the first six months, you start to get a decrease in molecular weight purely, as I mentioned, through this process of hydrolysis. All it takes is water for this device to resorb. And then finally, resorption, which occurs over about 12 to 24 months, and during which time the scaffold completely uh, disappears from the blood vessel. And what this means is that as the support drops off, as the scaffold begins to resorb, it goes away, much in contrast to a metal, the vascular function can recover, and this allows the vessel to uh, respond to shear stress and pulsatility. There's important tissue adaptation related to this, which brings structure and functionality back to the vessel that you cannot achieve with a metal stent. And this is an example of the preclinical model data that was submitted to the US FDA for the fully resorbable scaffold. So the response will be shown here at two years. So at two years, by histology, and this is a porcine model, you can still see the defects or the little areas where the struts existed, but there's no polymer in the vessel at this point. This is mostly a proteoglycan material with very uh, low cellular density left in the vessel at this point and no inflammation. At three years, then you'll start to see a change, but this is what you see at high magnification. A proteoglycan substitute, the strut polymer is now disappeared. At three years, you can see in the porcine animals, it starts to become even more difficult to see where the struts actually resided at the time of implantation. You see a nice neointimal border and almost you can see these very faint residual struts. And then at four years the resorption is complete. You can see a nice uh, trilaminar physiologic appearance of the vessel wall, intima media, and adventitia. And you can see it's almost impossible to see if there was ever a stent or scaffold placed in this vessel. I think this is what patients will want. And I think particularly the younger patients, you heard several very nice lectures today about the premature coronary artery disease that's occurring almost a decade sooner in this country in India compared to the rest of the world, the Western world. This is the type of device that a young patient should be receiving who may be having repeated interventions throughout their lifetime. So what do the clinical data look like so far? So, so far we have uh, a large uh, increasing body of data, still small relative to the rest of the metallic stent uh, world, but if you look, we have cohort A and cohort B, which cohort A is now up to five years. This is only 30 patients in the first in man pilot. Cohort B is 101 patients separated into two different groups, and I'll show you that data. And then we're currently enrolling in Absorb Extend, India has now fully enrolled Absorb Extend with 100 patients, which have been submitted to the regulatory bodies here, notified bodies here in India, 
uh, and going through the approval process at this time. Now the cohort B is probably the most recent data that we have presented at TCT this year uh, in, uh, in San Francisco. So I'd like to show you that. This is group B1, which is the first half, 45 patients. Group B2, 56 patients. These groups were split so that we could do invasive uh, follow-up at six months and two years in group one, and at 18 months, and then at three years in group uh, two. So I'd like to show you some of that data, most recent data. The first data is intention to treat clinical outcomes for the, the full cohort one and two out to one year. So we have both groups clinically followed out to one year. As you can see here, the MACE rate is at one year about uh, seven uh, patients for a total of 6.9 percent, which is right in there with most metallic drug-eluting stent uh, literature, and we've had no scaffold thrombosis, that is no stent thrombosis to date in the cohort B uh, population. Now this is a little bit of a complicated slide if you're not an interventional cardiologist and used to looking at these, but this is our what are called cumulative frequency distribution or CFD curves that describe how much ingrowth of tissue you get inside a stent after it's placed. And so what this shows here is that the black squares is the distribution of what we call late loss, which is neointima growth for a bare metal stent, a stent without drug. And that averages here, as you can see, the average late loss is about 0.8 millimeters. If you look at the orange uh, blocks, these, this is um, cohort A, which was a bioresorbable scaffold, which was our first in man design before we redesigned the scaffold for cohort B. And you can see the late loss is good, but not as good as Zions, which is a metallic drug eluting stent. And this is at six months. But the red diamonds, as you can see, is the cohort B scaffold, BBS scaffold which is the scaffold that was used in the study here in India, and it shows almost identical late loss or neoinimal thickening of only a very small amount uh, down in the 0.1 millimeter range overall, comparing very nicely to a metallic stent. Now what happens at one year? So we now have one year angiographic follow-up. This is from quantitative angiography, where the late loss now for cohort B, BBS, you can see is almost identical to a best-in-class metallic drug-eluting stent. And this is very important for that early revascularization success because interventional cardiologists want this to work like a stent early, be successful, but then resorb later without sacrificing any of those early uh, features. So this is the group one clinical results which we now have to two years, which was presented at TCT this past year in San Francisco. You can see the NACE rate here at two years is 6.8%. Uh, this is in the 45 patients. Very small patient population so far. These are our exploratory uh, studies, of course, with high degree of follow-up, including invasive follow-up. So far, no scaffold thrombosis. And then if you take that late loss curves that I just showed you and put them all together, what you'll see is that the orange, which is the BBS or absorbed scaffold late losses, are well inside what you see for Zions. Zions at six months is shown in the dark blue and at two years in the light blue. So you can see there is this late, little bit of late catch up, in, late increase in neointima over time with the metallic stent. With the scaffold you can see there's less of that and we hope to prove this more definitively even going further. And the other thing that's very interesting about the scaffold is once it resorbs, the vessel can then become pulsatile and have vasomotion. And this is something you would never see with a metallic stent, and that is that of the patients in cohort B so far, a, a large percentage of them actually start to show with intracoronary nitroglycerin vasomotion of the actual stented segment, which you, of course, would not see with a metallic stent because it would be fixed in place. And this is a uh, evidence of return of, of vasomotion and vascular function, which is important, particularly in a young, physiologically active uh, patient. And then just to compare to a metallic stent, we took the cohort B uh, uh, mace rate and compared it to a single 3 by 18 millimeter Zion stent, because so far, of course, we've only been single stent patients, 
And you can see the mace rates are very similar to a best-in-class metallic drug eluting stent. Now, the absorb extend study was an effort to start to use the scaffold in more complex patients. So take the absorb scaffold, the same one used in cohort B, and open it up to many more centers in the world and test the waters with more scaffolds per patient, overlapping scaffolds per patient, a little bit more complex lesions. And so that's what we've done, and that's what was done here in India with the 100 patients that were treated here in India. And Dr. Abizade, who is uh, in Brazil, is the principal investigator for this international registry. And at TCT this year, we presented six-month follow-up on the first 200 patients. And uh, as you can see, uh, the enrollment in India from Dr. Patel, eight patients. Uh, also, Dr. Srivas, uh, uh, Srinivas, seven patients. And Dr. Goel, five patients. So a number of Indian patients enrolled. And absorb extend so far, the clinical outcome from these 200 patients at six months, still early, uh, with 200 patients though, MACE rate, as you can see here, very favorable at only 3%, which is, uh, we're very excited about this. And if you look at the target vessel failure through six months and you compare it to the cohort B group, very, very uh, competitive. And then if you look at stent thrombosis or scaffold thrombosis, only one patient out of the 200 for a 0.5% probable, not definite, but a possible or probable stent thrombosis. So very low and very uh, favorable. So just to finish, in the last few seconds, uh, there's a probably the most fascinating patient in the world with this device is Mr. John Lamb, who is from New Zealand, who received the first bioresorbable scaffold in the world five years ago. And uh, it was done by Dr. Ormiston in New Zealand. He had an LAD that was done. Uh, actually, the, the lesion was in his uh, stenosis was in the, in the LAD. You can see here he had a moderate stenosis lesion, first patient in the world, and then received the scaffold here. You can see this is at six months, this is at two years, and then at five years, very nice preservation of the vessel. And by OCT, you can see here at five years, it's a very nice look. You can, cannot see the struts or scaffold remaining uh, in this patient. This is fascinating not to be able to see the stent at all in a patient at five years with a patent vessel without a permanent stent. So I'll stop there to stay on time and thank you very much for your attention. This is pictures from Haifa. I'll cover the area of stents. This is some disclosure. I'm, uh, I was uh, uh, co-founder of Instant, of Navicath and of uh, uh, Technion Institutions. Uh, this is uh, uh, our campus here uh, 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 at, uh, at Rambam, which is a large uh, thousand bed hospital uh, with the Faculty of Medicine. And uh, I was uh, really very uh, lucky to be the dean in 2004 where, when we had the first two Nobel laureates out of the Faculty of Medicine, Hershko and Chachanover. And, uh, and uh, just last year, there was another Nobelist, Professor Schechtman who discovered quasi uh, uh, crystals these five, uh, five symmetry of crystals that, that were both actually got the Nobel in chemistry, but obviously Hershko and Chekhanover is on ubiquity, more medically related, and crystals may be related to stents, but not yet to medicine. Uh, well, the, we all know Andreas Gunzig, he was really the guru of interventional cardiology, and he made what we call the first revolution, opening of a discipline uh, which is called interventional uh, cardiology, dreaming to do the procedure in an alive patient. And we see his tools here, the angioplasty balloons, and the first patient who's still, like the patient that Dr. Simenton showed, who's still alive and talks to meetings, that has his, uh, his LAD lesion with balloon only. Uh, and uh, amazing results. Now if we look at, after this uh, first evolution, the evolution of PCI in general, we see really the POBA was the first evolution and it actually took another 10 years until the first bare metal stents got in, keeping the artery open with the, obviously palmas and shots uh, required the first honor for that. Later on, drug eluting stents, 10 years later, and beyond, the question is what's going to happen beyond 2011. So uh, 
Non-polymerity as uh, will probably be there in other possible solutions we just heard from Dr. Simington, some of them. If we go to the first evolution, we all know the historical Palmas shut stand and uh, I think we were also involved uh, at the very early phases of stents with the company Instant out of Israel uh, that was later all acquired by Medtronic. This was a cardio coil, a stent that was clinically working but did not reach the market. It was a, you see it was a, a type of a coil. And later on the B stent, the bare metal stent was uh, used by Medtronic for a couple of years worldwide. And uh, we all know the history of bare metal stents, some of historical pictures, me and Martin Leon implanting the stents in 1994. Obviously, uh, after it took six agonizing years to get the uh, the, the first stents approved by the FDA. And we all know that, and now it became standard practice stenting. Dry, the drug eluting stents came with a, a sirolimus a, a drug that really showed initially a very amazing anti proliferative response versus bare metal stents in this is a swine model. And this really opened up a whole new area of drug elution which still continues to evolve uh, until today and, and, uh, and today. Depends on the polymer, on, on, a, on the types of polymer used, on other possibilities of how to deliver the drug in a transient period to the vessel. So this is some of the first generation drug loading stents, the Taxus and the Cypher, uh, the Taxus with the Paclitax as a drug, specific polymer and the type of stents that we use, and the cipher with the sirolimus as a drug, polymer uh, type and, and, and velocity uh, scaffold. Then came the second generation drug eluting stents, the Uzolut science that we heard about. Again, the concept of a drug and a polymer and a metal scaffold, that's basically the basic principle for all these uh, type of stents. Now, there are other many other concepts and, and ideas about how to deliver drug to the, to the vessel wall with a stent. The durable poly polymer uh, obviously was the first thing that was tested with these initial stents. Then a biodegradable polymer uh, that actually attaches to the metal, that's another solution, and it can have also only an abluminal surface, not only the, the, the blood surface which doesn't need a uh, polymer and a drug. Then concepts of pooling surfaces, and we heard about the fully biodegradable concept that Dr. Simiton has presented. Uh, the bioabsorbable polymers, uh, DES, there are a couple of ideas, uh, but uh, just as, as a few examples, the biolimus with an abluminal type of, uh, of uh, drug elution only, uh, and, and you can see the concept here uh, with all these type of stents. Uh, uh, the Nevo stents that is not any, anymore in the market uh, today, maybe it will come back uh, sometimes in the future with a wells design that will actually uh, get the, the drugs out. And uh, I wouldn't go into all these details for the, uh, for the sake of time, but now you can also see uh, other types of concept. This is a drug fill stents technology, uh, polymer free entirely. There is a, there's a, there's a hole in the middle of the wire and, and drug is diluted through laser holes in this in the in the, in the stent uh, strut. That's another concept and obviously uh, all these are, are in progress in terms of, of study. If we look at one of the stents we, with a biodegradable polymer, that actually polymer goes away, a uh, biolimus for example, and if we look with the leader's trial over time, you can see that it may have some advantage over time with, with late results, but this needs to be established and these are just, uh, I think, uh, initial uh, data. Uh, obviously, the stent, as I told you, is, is a combination of, uh, me the mechanics of a stent is extremely important. The strength, the ability to withstand strong arteries, flexibility, comfortab comf comfort comfortability, and, and metallurgy evolved over time. The first stents, really, with the closed cell designs, Cypher had a, a thick a stent, thick st a strut thickness of 140 microns, 
And uh, if we look at, for example, at other stents, they continue to decrease. And Division, for example, has 81 microns. And the newer stents, uh, Biomime and Amitsu stent, have really a tendency to mark decrease in stent thickness. And there have been studies that have shown that the strut thickness is related to proliferation. So there is obviously uh, a lot to do. If we look at the strut, uh, at this, the same stents, at this def different generation of stents, we can see the different design again, how the thickness of the struts becomes much thinner. The Mitsu stent is uh, yet to be uh, uh, tested and, and shown, but I mean, these are really fascinating ways how to get stents to be very low profile on one state during delivery, and also uh, the strut scaffold becomes a very low profile and, and, and it matters with proliferation. Other types of stents, just to show you a dual therapy stent, the one that actually has a low dose volumus in biodegradable polymer on the abluminal surface. And the luminal surface has some kind of antibody that actually attracts endothelial cells with better coverage of the stents that we have seen. Other types of stents which really are all exciting, the create distinctive features polymer free, free platform, a bioinducer surface uh, in, in second generation pure carbon, and, and, uh, and uh, amphilous formation, sirolimus with organic acid as, as a drug that actually is being delivered to the, to the wall. Mitsu novel drug eluting stents. So you see, lots of new stents are continuing to be evolved and developed and optimizing. Uh, the metallurgy and, and other concepts that, that are so important to the drug eluting stents concept. Um, if obviously bifurcation stenting, and I'm this title, let's see if we can go next. Okay, as we can see here, uh, bifurcation stenting is a unique uh, challenge. Uh, we can see it here, uh, a unique challenge for stenting and it, it's pure mechanical and it hasn't been solved optimally yet. I mean, there are so many devices in the market, so many attempts, and just this is one, ju just one example, to see how complex is stenting a bifurcation and how difficult it is to generate an optimal bifurcation and sometimes why it, why, when it looks optimal and on, on, on geography, after we end the results, if you look at exactly how the struts are disturbed, dispersed in this bifurcation, it's really non-optimal. Non so this is an unsolved problem. And most of the bifurcation stents don't have drugs, so not drug looking stents. So bifurcation is yet a mechanical and, 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 and challenge to be solved. Uh, so there are many other solutions to bifurcation. I'm not going to go, to go into all of them, but there have been dozens of, of attempts over the last two decades, I would say, to try and, and, and find methods of, of the bifurcation stenting. The BIOS, for example, is, a, is now a drug eluting stents bifurcation concept that is trying to be shown. Another concept which uh, to complete the picture is a pericardium covered stent. This is for, uh, for perforations, for other concepts, uh, for maybe vein graft when you want to limit the amount of debris from the bloodstream. You can see the concept of this uh, pericardium covered stent. Some initial experiments are very promising. We've heard about fully biodegradable stent platform. Uh, we, we know actually uh, the stents, uh, the, the polymer stents have been tried way before, uh, uh, actually before 2000. The animal studies were done in 1996. This is the first uh, fully biodegradable stent by Igaki Tamai from, from Japan, uh, which was in clinical trials, but wasn't that successful. I mean, the, the, the study was very small, the results were moderately good, but over time it didn't catch. And the problem was proliferation. Too much proliferation generated by the degraded uh, biomatrix. But only later when the concept of involving a drug eluting